Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to rebuild the entire rear suspension on a 2004 Lexus GS300. The process is similar but not exactly the same for many rear wheel drive Lexus models such as the IS300 or the SC300. Rear wheel drive vehicles such as the second generation Lexus GS300 that I'll be working on in this video experience a lot of stress with the rear suspension as that is where the drive wheels are at. Over time, this can lead to clunking sounds from the back and a general harsh ride feel, especially when you go over potholes or pumps. This is because the various ball joints and bushings in the rear suspension are worn out. The life of your suspension components depends greatly on how you drive and the conditions in which you drive, but on an average, suspension components should be changed every 80,000 miles or so. I'll be replacing every part of the suspension except the shocks. Here are the part numbers for the parts that I ordered from Rock Auto. You can also find a detailed list of what suspension component corresponds to each part number in the video description below. Apart from these components, the rear knuckle carrier has two bushings that should be replaced. I've also included links for where you can purchase these bushings in the video description. To start off, with the car on the ground, break each of the five lug nuts loose. They accept a 21mm socket. Now that the lug nuts are loose, you can start jacking the car up. The rear jacking point is located under the rear differential as shown and the jack stand points are located on the rear subframe as shown in the picture again. It's also useful to place wheel chocks in front of the front wheels to make sure that the car has no chance of rolling. Jack the car up and then slowly lower it back onto the jack stands. Once the car is secure on the jack stands, raise the jack slowly so that it just touches the jacking point without lifting the car up. This will serve as an additional safety measure. Now you can go ahead and completely remove the lug nuts and then the wheel. Slide the wheel under the car as an additional safety measure in case the jack stands fail. The first step is to remove the wheel speed sensor wire from its brackets. The first bracket is located on the chassis and the second bracket is on the tow control link. Remove the two 10mm bolts and set the wire free. Next, we can remove the brake caliper from the rotor. The brake caliper is held in by two 17mm bolts. You will need a breaker bar as they are on pretty tight. Remove the caliper assembly and then set it on a tall object like a bucket to make sure that the brake line does not get stretched. First, we'll remove lower control arm number 1, which connects the knuckle to the chassis. As you can see, it is held in by two 17mm bolts. While removing the bolt that goes to the knuckle, you'll need to hold the nut on the other side so that the bolt doesn't spin when you remove it. Depending upon how much rust is present and how long the suspension components haven't been changed, you may require a fair amount of wiggling to get the bolts out. Don't forget the washers as well. Remove the lower control arm and set it aside. As you can see, it has one bushing. Next, we can move on to removing lower control arm number two. This control arm connects the chassis to the sway bar end link, the shock absorber, and the rear knuckle. The bolt connecting the control arm to the rear knuckle is used to set the camber angle for the alignment of the suspension. To make sure that the alignment doesn't go too out of whack when we put everything back together, we will mark the current position of the camber plate using a paint marker. Now we can go ahead and remove the bolt and the camber plate. First loosen the nut and then remove the camber plate. You may have to tap it a few times as it may be stuck onto the control arm. Again, depending on how much rust is present, the bolt may be stuck inside the bushing of the rear knuckle, so you may have to push pretty hard to get it out. Next, loosen the 19mm bolt that holds the lower control arm to the shock absorber. This bolt will also likely be pretty tight, so you may have to tap it out. I used a hammer and a small extension which can fit into the bolt hole to do this. While tapping the bolts out, make sure to tap it out only when the threads are completely disengaged in order to make sure that you don't damage the threads of the bolt. Next up is a sway bar and link which is held in by a 12mm bolt. You should be able to tap this out with just a hammer. To get to the final bolt holding the lower control arm in, you'll need to remove the suspension member brace which is located just under the axle shaft. It is held in by two 14mm bolts. Remove the first bolt and then loosen the second one so you can swivel the brace out of the way for now. Now you should be able to access the final 19mm bolt holding the lower control arm to the chassis. Remove the bolt and set the lower control arm aside. As you can see, it has one bushing which will be replaced when we put our new control arm in. Now that the shock absorber has been freed from the suspension, we can go ahead and remove it from the car entirely. To do this, go into the trunk and remove the floor mat and the cover above the spare tire. Remove the 10mm bolt holding the carpet down and the hook in place. 
There are two other clips which hold the carpet to the side of the trunk that you'll need to remove. These clips are pretty cheap to replace, so I don't mind if I damage them while removing them. You can find the part numbers for these clips in the video description as well. Now you should be able to pull the cover back to expose the three nuts holding the shock absorber in. You'll need a 14mm deep socket to get these nuts off. Finally, there are two 14mm bolts holding the shock to the chassis. Once you remove these two bolts, the shock assembly should come free. Keep in mind that the assembly is pretty heavy, so remember to support the shock before you remove the final bolt. I won't be replacing my shocks in this video as they are still pretty good, but obviously if you need to do that, now is a great time to do so. Now that we have a little more space to work with, we can go ahead and remove the 14mm nut holding the sway bar and link in place and remove the end link from the car. Now we can move on to the toe control link which sets the toe angle for the rear suspension. It has two fasteners, one to the rear knuckle and the other to the chassis. To access the rear fastener, you'll first need to remove this mud cover. This is pretty simple as there are just two 10mm screws holding it on. Just like the camber bolt on the lower control arm, you'll need to mark the position of this bolt so that you can get an approximate position of the toe angle once you put the suspension back together. Now you can go ahead and remove the first 70mm nut holding the toe control link to the rear knuckle. Once you remove the fastener, the toe control link is going to be stuck pretty tight to the knuckle. Because of the presence of the brake rotor dust cover, there isn't enough space to get a pitman arm puller over here, so you can use a hammer to bonk it loose. If you are going to reuse the toe control link, which I don't suggest, remember to hit only the knuckle and not the bolt since you don't want to damage the threads of the bolt. After making sure that you've marked the position of the toe angle plate, you can go ahead and loosen the 19mm nut holding the toe control link to the chassis. Remove the nut, the plate and then the bolt. You may need to use a hammer to tap it out because of some rust. Once both the fasteners are out, you should now be able to remove the toe control link from the chassis. The little space into which the toe control link bolts into is pretty tight, so you may have to wiggle it a fair amount to get it out. The toe control link we just removed has one bushing and one ball joint. The bushing is replaceable, whereas the ball joint is not. After releasing the parking brake if it is on, remove the brake rotor and set it aside. It is pretty heavy, so be careful not to drop it on the floor as it may get damaged. Now we can go ahead and remove the wheel speed sensor. It is held on by a 10mm bolt to the knuckle. Depending upon the amount of rust which is present on the suspension, sometimes the wheel speed sensor may be glued pretty tight to the knuckle. The wheel speed sensor is pretty expensive to replace, so be very careful not to damage it while pulling it out of the knuckle. Once you've removed it, stow the wire away in a safe place as shown so that it doesn't get tangled or cut in any way. Remove the cotter pin on the axle shaft. You can use a pair of pliers as shown to bend it and push it through the hole. I'm using a rubber mallet to tap the pliers in order to get the cotter pin out as it is pretty thick. Put the brake rotor back on so that we can engage the parking brake which will hold the axle shaft in place while we get the axle nut off. Temporarily install the toe control link so that the knuckle doesn't rotate while we loosen the axle nut. The axle nut requires a 32mm 12 point deep socket. The axle nut is torqued to 213 foot pounds, so you will need a long breaker bar to get it off. I ended up slipping the handle of my jack onto the breaker bar and it was pretty easy. Remove the axle nut and set it aside. To remove the axle shaft, you'll need to remove the suspension member brace. Remove the remaining fastener and set the brace aside. Before removing the axle shaft, you'll need to put match marks on the axle shaft and where it bolts into the differential so that the same orientation is retained when it goes back in. The axle shaft is held in by 6 hexagon bolts and 2 washers. You will need a 10mm hexagon socket to get the bolts out. While removing the hexagon bolts, be very careful not to strip them out as space is limited and stripping them out will mean a lot of work to get it out. In order to gain access to the hidden bolts on top, you can rotate the axle shaft using the lug nut studs on the knuckle. Don't forget the two washers along with the six bolts. Disengage the parking brake and remove the brake rotor again. Support the inboard side of the axle shaft using a jack so that it doesn't flex when we remove it. Now we can go ahead and tap the axle shaft out of the knuckle. To do this, 
Place a wooden block on the axle shaft at the position shown and then hit it with a hammer to get it out. Do not hit the end of the axle shaft directly with your hammer as this will cause the end of the axle shaft to mushroom and then it cannot be removed from the knuckle. As you hammer on the wooden block, you will see that the shaft slowly recedes into the knuckle. Keep pushing the axle shaft back in until it looks like this. We won't be able to remove it all the way just yet, so this is fine for now. Remove the inboard side of the axle shaft from the differential and set it on the exhaust pipe as shown. Be careful not to drop it as this may damage it. To completely remove the axle shaft, we'll need to remove the parking brake cable from the rear knuckle. Remove the two shoe return springs using a pair of needle nose pliers by unhooking them as shown. Next, now that there is some slack, remove the shoe strut and its spring and set it aside. Remove the parking brake adjuster which is present at the bottom by prying it out from between the shoes. You should be able to see the hooked end of the tension spring on the front shoe as shown. Pushing on it with a pair of pliers will release the tension spring and you can remove it from the bottom as shown. To release the front shoe, push down in the direction of the red arrow on the shoe hold on spring. Once you slide the shoe hold on spring out of the little notch, the shoe should be free and you can remove it from the parking brake assembly. Repeat the same process to release the rear shoe. Push the rear shoe hold on spring inwards and then remove the rear shoe. This shoe will be held on by the parking brake cable. Remove the two 10mm bolts holding the parking brake cable to the rotor backing plate and you should be able to slide the cable back and forth so you now have some slack. Slide the axle shaft out of the knuckle by pulling the knuckle towards you. Now you can remove the axle shaft and set it aside. Again, be careful not to drop it as this may damage it. Unfortunately, my camera died when I was filming the process for removing the parking brake cable from the rear shoe, but the process to get it out is pretty simple. All you need to do is compress the spring, pull the cable forward so that the thick hexagon part in the front exits the shoe, and then pull the cable upward to free it through the gap. Now you can go ahead and break the nut holding the upper control arm to the rear knuckle free. The knuckle will rotate as you try to break it loose, so you will need someone to hold the knuckle in place. Yeah. Remove the nut and set it aside. Place the pitman arm puller so that the jaws of the puller are between the knuckle and the ball joint. Then turn the center screw by hand until it meets the ball joint stud. Before you apply a ratchet or a breaker bar and turn the center screw further, support the knuckle by a jack in case it falls. Now go ahead and turn the center screw until the pitman arm puller breaks the knuckle free from the ball joint. Remove the knuckle and set it aside. Now that we have the knuckle free from the suspension, I'll show you the two suspension bushings I was talking about that need to be replaced. As you can see, the first bushing goes to lower control arm number 2, whereas the second one goes to lower control arm number 1. The bushing going to lower control arm number 2 is fairly easy to replace and you can do it at home with a ball joint press. Because of the way the knuckle is designed, the second bushing going to lower control arm number 1 is harder to get a ball joint press onto. Since I had the entire knuckle removed, I elected to take the knuckle to a local shop which removed the old bushings and pressed in new bushings for me. And it was pretty cheap, only around 40 bucks or so. Now is also a good time to inspect the wheel bearing. A healthy wheel bearing should not make any noise when you spin the knuckle around like this. Here is an example of a bad wheel bearing which I found on the driver's side of the car. Now we can go ahead and remove the final part of the suspension, the upper control arm. It is held in by two 17mm bolts and nuts as shown. Use a breaker bar to loosen the bolts and the nuts and then remove them. Don't forget the washers when you do so. As you can see, the upper control arm has one ball joint which is non-replaceable whereas the two bushings can be pressed out and replaced with new ones. The bushings are visibly in pretty bad condition which is not surprising as they have more than 200,000 miles on them and are in dire need of replacement. Place the new control arm with the ball joint pointing downwards as shown 
and insert the bolts to keep it in place. Remember to put the washer on the opposite side of the bolt heads as shown. Before torquing the nuts down, the upper control arm has to be raised to normal ride height. If the upper control arm is not torqued on at ride height, then the bushings will be twisted when you lower the car back down and this will lead to premature wearing of the bushings. Once the control arm is at the right height, tighten the nut down so that it stays in place there. While torquing the bolts down, you will need to hold the nut on the other side so that the bolt does not spin. This is easy enough for the right hand side bolt, but for the left hand side bolt, there is not enough space to get a wrench in there. Luckily, you can get a wrench on it by snaking it through the back just above the exhaust pipe as shown. The torque spec for these two fasteners is 65 foot pounds. Now we will install the knuckle back onto the control arm. Slide a jack under the knuckle as it is pretty heavy. Slide the knuckle onto the control arm and thread the nut on to keep it in place. While you tighten the nut down, the entire knuckle will rotate, so you'll need to temporarily install lower control arm number 1 and the tow control link as shown so that it stays in place while we torque it down. This nut needs to be torqued to 80 foot pounds. Now we will install the cotter pin. Thread the cotter pin through the hole in the ball joint stud and then bend it downwards as shown. If the hole in the ball joint stud does not align with the castle nut space, tighten the castle nut to align it. Now we will install the axle shaft. Place the jack under where the axle shaft will go so that it can be supported while you install it. First, push the outboard end of the axle shaft through the knuckle. It should look like this at the end. The next step is to bolt the axle shaft to the differential. Remember that the axle shaft should be installed with the match marks lining up. Since we can't see the match marks on the differential, we will temporarily install the axle shaft so that we can rotate the differential until the match marks become visible again. Installing two of the bolts should be sufficient for this. Once you can see the match marks, remove the axle shaft and reinstall it so that the match marks on both the axle shaft and the differential line up. Before you install the hexagon bolts, give them a light coat of engine oil. Install all six hexagon bolts along with their two washers. We will talk them to spec later after we install the parking brake. While reinstalling the parking brake, a few parts need to be lubricated with high temperature grease. The first is the parking brake adjuster. Spread some grease on the threads of the bolt and also the cap as shown. Once you've sufficiently lubricated both of them, thread the bolt onto the adjuster and then install the cap on the other side. Next, you'll need to lubricate the five areas where the parking brake shoes slide up and down as shown. Slide the parking brake cable through the backing plate and install the two 10mm bolts to hold it in place. Make sure the two bolts are nice and snug. To install the rear shoe onto the parking brake cable, compress the spring and then push the parking brake shoe onto the space that appears. Hook the tension spring onto the rear shoe first and then hook it onto the front shoe as shown. This will hold the two shoes together. Now install the parking brake shoe adjuster. You'll need to pull the two shoes apart against the force of the tension spring so that you can slide it into place as shown. Now you can go ahead and install the entire assembly onto the knuckle as shown. First we'll go ahead and install the two shoe return springs without the shoe strut so that the two shoes stay in place while we install the hold down springs and cups. Just like before when we removed them, use a pair of needle nose pliers to hook the two return springs onto the knob as shown. It should look like this. First install the shoe hold down spring cup over the pin followed by the spring and finally the retainer hat. As you can see, the retainer hat has a little notch through which you can slide it onto the pin. Once it is on the pin, you'll need to turn it 90 degrees so that it is locked into place and cannot escape as you can see. Using this special brake tool from the Harbor Freight brake tool set that I've linked in the video description makes this job much easier. While you compress the spring and rotate the hat, the pin will move backward making it harder to install the hat. As you can see, I'm using a screwdriver to make sure that the pin stays in place. This is honestly the part that I found the toughest about the entire rebuild as the spring is very tight and you need a lot of patience to go through this. It took a lot of effort but I was finally able to install the hat. Repeat the same process for the rear shoe as shown.
Now we can go ahead and remove any one of the two return springs so we can install the shoe strut and its spring. Slide the shoe strut and spring into place and then reinstall the shoe return spring that you removed. Hooking the spring back on will require a little more force as you now have the shoe strut and its spring in place. This completes the reinstallation of the parking brake assembly. Slide the rotor back on and then engage the parking brake so that the axle shaft stays in place while we torque to spec the 6 bolts holding the axle shaft to the differential. The torque specs for these 6 bolts is 61 foot pounds. While torquing these bolts down, make sure to do so in a crisscross pattern so that the torque is evenly distributed. After torquing a bolt down, it helps to mark it with a paint marker so that you know you're done with it. Just like earlier, in order to access the hidden bolts at the top, you'll need to disengage the parking brake, turn the axle shaft using the lug nut studs, and then re-engage the parking brake so that you can torque the remaining bolts down to spec. Next, we will move on to installing our new tow control link. First, insert the bushing end of the tow control link into the space provided in the chassis, followed by inserting the ball joint end into the knuckle. Thread the nut onto the ball joint stud and tighten it in order to secure the tow control link. We will torque this nut down to spec later as it requires a suspension to be preloaded. For the other fastener, insert the bolt through the hole followed by the tow angle plate and the nut on top of it. Roughly align the tow angle plate with the paint marks that we made earlier and then tighten the nut on top to secure it in place. While installing the new sway bar end link, I ran into a bit of trouble. As I tried tightening the nut onto the sway bar end link so that it would stay in place, it would just not happen. As you can see, the stud keeps spinning and this makes it impossible to install. It seems to be a defective product. Since the sway bar end link does not affect alignment and is pretty easy to install, I'll be skipping it for now and doing it later. Next, we will reinstall the shock. Push the studs of the shock up through the chassis and then install the two 14mm bolts to hold it in place. Go back into the trunk and tighten the three nuts securing the shock. The torque spec for these three nuts is 47 foot pounds. The torque spec for these two bolts is 13 foot pounds. Now we can move on to installing our new lower control arm number 2. Push the end of the lower control arm into the space provided in the chassis as shown and then insert the bolt to hold it in place. Swing the lower control arm up and push the shock absorber back so that the holes align and you can push the bolt through. Finally, align the holes on the knuckle and the lower control arm and push the bolt through. Install the camber angle plate followed by the nut on top of it. As you can see, the paint marks we made for the camber angle are on the old lower control arm. You can hold up the old control arm against the new one to get a good approximation of where the paint marks would be on the new control arm. Since we're going to get the suspension aligned anyway, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just a rough alignment is sufficient for now. I ended up making paint marks on the new control arm in the same position as they were on the old control arm to help with aligning the camber plate. Once the camber plate is properly aligned, tighten the nut on top to secure it in place. The final part of the suspension that we will be replacing is lower control arm number 1. Line up the open side of the control arm with the bolt holes on the knuckle and then slide the bolt through to hold it in place. For the other fastener holding the lower control arm to the chassis, you may find that you don't have enough room to swing the arm up into place. The easiest way to get around this is by temporarily adjusting the camber angle of the rear knuckle. As you can see, the camber angle measures how much the bottom end of the knuckle is pushed out compared to the top. By turning the camber bolt clockwise as shown, you can temporarily increase the camber angle and this should give you enough space to swing the lower control arm into position. Once the holes are lined up, push the bolt through to hold it in place and then install the nut. Don't forget to redo the alignment of the camber bolt on lower control arm number 2. Now we can move on to installing the axle nut. Thread the nut on by hand and then tighten it down with the ratchet. The axle nut needs to be torqued to 213 foot pounds. Remember not to use any kind of extension on the torque wrench as this will throw off the reading. Insert a new quarter pin through the hole on the axle shaft and then bend it around it as shown. Do not reuse the old quarter pin. Before reinstalling the wheel speed sensor, Clean off both the wheel speed sensor itself and also the hole in which it bolts into on the knuckle so that there is no dust or debris inside.
Install the wheel speed sensor onto the knuckle. There isn't enough space here to get a torque wrench in, so it is sufficient to snug the bolt down with the ratchet. Now that we've installed all new suspension components and their new bushings, we can move on to stabilizing the suspension and torquing the various fasteners down to spec. Stabilizing or pre-loading the suspension means to put a load on the suspension so that the various new bushings that we installed are in the same position that they would be if the car was on the ground. If the suspension isn't pre-loaded before the fasteners are torqued down to spec, the bushings will be twisted and they will wear out faster than normal. To pre-load the suspension, place a wooden block in between the jack and the lowest point of the rear knuckle and jack it up. Raise the jack until the distance between the upper arch and the middle of the axle shaft as shown is approximately 15.3 inches. This is the normal ride height when the car is on the ground. Now we can proceed with torquing the various fasteners down to spec. First, lower control arm number 2 to chassis with 81 foot-pounds. Then the lower control arm number 2 to shock with 81 foot-pounds again. Lower control arm number 2 to knuckle with 81 foot-pounds. Toe control linked to the chassis with 36 foot-pounds. Toe control linked to the knuckle with 44 foot-pounds. Lower control arm number 1 to the knuckle with 55 foot-pounds. And finally, lower control arm number 1 to the chassis with 55 foot-pounds again. Now that all the fasteners have been torqued down to spec, you can release the load on the suspension. Install the two brackets holding the wheel speed sensor wire to the toe control link and to the chassis. Reinstall the suspension member brace under the axle shaft with the two 14mm bolts. Install the lower mud cover with the two 10mm screws. Before reinstalling the brake caliper onto the rotor, you may have to push the pistons back so that the rotor can fit in between the brake pads. In case you don't need to do this, you can just skip ahead to the next chapter in the video. First, remove the little quarter pin on the pad guide pin with a pair of pliers as shown. Remove the pad guide pin. Using a pair of pliers, compress the anti-squeal spring and remove it from in between the pads. Remove the two brake pads in order to expose the pistons. Before pushing the pistons back in, you'll need to open up the brake bleeder screw. Remember to keep the caliper upright while the brake bleeder screw is open. Crack open the brake bleeder screw and keep loosening it until a little bit of brake fluid comes out. Using a pair of channel locks, push the brake pistons back in as far as they will go. Once the two pistons are sufficiently depressed, close up the brake bleeder screw and snug it up. Insert the two brake pads into place, followed by the anti-squeal spring, and finally, the pad guide pin. Install the two bolts holding the brake caliper to the rotor, and then torque them down to 77 foot-pounds. Don't forget to install the little quarter pin on the brake pad guide pin. Put the wheel back onto the lug nut studs, and then tighten the lug nuts until they are snug. Now we can lower the car back to the ground again. Jack the car up so that it clears the jack stands, remove the jack stands from underneath the car and then slowly lower the car back to the ground. Torque the lug nuts down to 77 foot-pounds, going in a criss-cross pattern. This completes the suspension rebuild for the passenger side. Once you've completed the exact same process for the other side of the car, the next step is to get the rear suspension aligned. Even though we matched up the positions of the new suspension components to the old ones using match marks, it is important to get an alignment done after working on any part of the suspension. Even minor inaccuracies in the various suspension angles can lead to increased tire wear, decreased ride quality, and faster wear of the suspension components you just installed. So that brings us to the end of this video. If you liked it and would like to see more of my content, make sure to hit the subscribe button down below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.